next part of the discussion that we're going to be talking about is pain management and safety of different pain management approaches. And the reason why this is important to have the discussion is that you may have heard a lot of things in the news about what we have prescribed as doctors for a couple of decades and what we thought we were doing the right thing in terms of prescribing opioid medications, narcotic medications for painful conditions for a long term. And what we thought we were doing correctly, the studies are now showing that we, we goofed, we erred, that a lot of the information that was given to physicians was probably false. And so we're learning from that because the practice of medicine is always changing. We're always learning more things. And we want to give information to you today about pain management because you might have family members that are hearing about some of the dangers or concerns that we now have about op opioids. Or the White House has also given a draft statement that in our country, in the United States, we do have a true concern about people that are dying in their sleep from taking opioids for a long period of time. This does not mean that opioids don't have a role in cancer pain. They still do. This does not mean that opioids do not have a role if you break your arm and you need some short-term acute pain management. But we're going to talk about some of the concerns now we have about opioids for long-term use over years and some of the reasons why. So, this is an interesting uh, statistic we'll talk about in the next slide, but we have a pill for everything almost. And doctors have to own that. There are times where we prescribe far too many pills. So how did we get to this situation in the first place? And now what are doctors trying to do about this? But this statistic here, that opioids are painkillers. If you've heard of the um, medication oxycodone or Percocet, hydrocodone, Vicodin, oxycontin, fentanyl patches, these are all in these classes of opioids or pain relievers. And we're only 4.6% of the whole world's population, but we consume in the United States 80% of the whole world's supply of opioids. And I challenge us in the United States that we don't have 80% more pain receptors in our body, but why is it that we got to this situation? So we need to do something. In 2007 in the United States, we had 27,000 people die from a drug overdose from opioids. And this was unintentional. This was not people taking a handful of opioids trying to end their life. They were taking them for what we thought were legitimate reasons. And if you remember Jana talking about some of the ways that medications can decrease our brain and our amount of brain power that we have, opioids suppress our brain. They suppress our breathing. And this is now what we're finding, that these opioids decrease our ability to have our brain remember to keep breathing through the night while we're sleeping. And people just unfortunately pass away in their sleep because the opioids are stopping their breathing. So this is a public health concern now. It's not meant to be a takeaway from anybody that has pain. And pain is real. But we need to look for other ways that we can manage that pain so we really stop the um, dying that's occurring in our country. This means there's one death every 19 minutes in the United States in 2007. And there's more overdose deaths now from opioids, those medications I just talked about, and your doctor prescribes them. They're legal medications. But it's more overdose deaths than heroin and cocaine combined. And for every unintentional opioid death, nine people are admitted to a substance abuse treatment. For every one unintentional death, there's 35 emergency room visits, and 161 report drug abuse or dependence. 
and 461 report non-medical uses of opioids. And here in Oregon, we're number one. Out of all the states, we're number one. Now where they got this statistic was not the amount of overdose deaths. We're number one in the amount of opioids that are being prescribed specifically in the age range of young adults. Age 18 to 25. That, that um, we're number one, we lead the whole country. And there was a hand up, so I wanted to make sure that, did you have a question or comment or? So my condolences to both of you. And if you had a problem hearing that, this was one of our people in the audience sharing that she lost her 37 year old son to this condition. And then initially on the autopsy, they had listed down congestive heart failure. But after looking into it more, the cause of the, of the death was an unintentional overdose, stopping that breathing center in the brain. And it's a true risk. Thank you for sharing. And again, my condolences to both of you. So the problem here in Oregon, in Oregon alone, we had 154 Oregonians die in 2014. We did see a rate of the opioid deaths decrease between 2006 and 2014. So that is some good movement that we've been seeing, but we want to prevent those overdose deaths. And this is why we have to get on hand, a handle on the amount of opioids that we're prescribing in the first place. In 2013, we had 330 Oregonians that were hospitalized due to opioids. And the cost of care was $9.1 million in Oregon alone. And that was in 2013. The cost because of hospitalizations, the emergency room visits, all the treatment uh, that needs to take place after a person is identified. So I would ask ourselves, what could we have done with that $9.1 million in our state? Could have we put it towards education? Could we have put it towards our roads, our public utilities? But we spent $9.1 million on our opioid issue. Misuse. 5% of the population had self-reported non-medical use of prescription pain relievers in 2012-2013. What this means is family members that might be using opioids that are prescribed for somebody else, but they're using it for a different reason. And uh, that, that number, I would think that's probably higher today because a lot of it is probably not um, disclosed. So this was just uh, done in a survey. It's for those that may not have heard, but uh, this member here had a legitimate need for oxycodone after a surgery. And we don't want people to suffer after surgery, after a need for an acute episode, but the oxycodone that she had on her counter was missing afterwards. And um, it can be sold on the street. And in fact, right now, oxycodone tablets um, are more expensive than heroin on the street. That's really concerning. Question, comment? How do you dispose of Right. So through the Sheriff's Department, there are now drug take-back days. And um, if you need information about this, you can call our customer service line, and we can give you dates of when those uh, drug take-back days are occurring. Um, I do know that if you took the prescription to the pharmacy that you received it, at initially, that they may be able to help you with that too. But um, I wouldn't say that every pharmacy is capable of taking back those medications. So I may reserve that um, question later for Crystal, our pharmacist as well, as to how to best safely dispose of, of the medications. In Lebanon, the police department has a disposal there at all times. Mm -hmm. All right. It's sitting between the two doors. Okay. That's great to know. So in Lebanon, the police department has a disposal there that you can take things to. Crystal just let me know that Philomath has that as well. So, and so does Albany. So this is great. These are great resources. Right. So these prescriptions, while they're being used for sometimes legitimate needs, can really change the way our body is reacting. 
and um, it can really change our mindset and maybe our behavior. So I um, wonder if that was a reason why this person had this accident right into your front yard. That's horrible. I wouldn't say probably so. Yeah. Right. Right. So we know we do have a problem. Why? People initially, when they take pain relievers, opioids, you can get a bit of a high from these opioids, but it's not the same high that you would get from marijuana or the same type of feeling from alcohol. It is sometimes a feeling of just joy and comfort. And it's because it affects our brain receptors, called our mu receptors. And this will sometimes give, uh, if you've heard um, people talk about endorphins, if something really great happened and you were just so excited and on top of the world, you feel really joy. You have a lot of joy occurring right then and there. And it's because of our own body that creates what these things called endorphins. These endorphins act on the mu receptors in our brain. And that's exactly where the opioids act as well. So very legitimate in relieving pain, but they start to produce a feeling of intense joy and comfort. And this is where some people start to really like that feeling of joy because it's a replacement for all the other things that might not be going as well in their life. But the risk of respiratory depression, the breathing, is what really has our concern. And at higher doses of opioids and used for long periods of time, the breathing is slowed to the point where eventually we just stop breathing and we don't know about it. And it happens in our sleep. And who are people that are more at risk of this too? people that have sleep apnea, where they're not breathing well in the middle of the night and they might need their machines to help their breathing. If you're on opioids, that risk of stopping breathing is even greater. It can be especially dangerous as well when we combine opioids with another class of medications called benzodiazepines. And remember from the 60s and 70s, Mama's Little Helper? things we call Valium, right? That's a benzodiazepine. If you combine a benzodiazepine like Valium or Alprazolam, Xanax, all these medications that can help with short-term anxiety, or some people take them at night to sleep, but if you combine a medication like a benzodiazepine along with an opioid, your risk of having your breathing stop in the middle of the night is really, really increased. We can get physical dependence on opioids. And for a long period of time, what happens, those mu receptors I was talking about in the brain, they start to get dependent on the same amount of medication always coming in, and they start to like it. And what happens without us really knowing, we start to want to have higher doses to try to give us the same effect that that lower dose once did. And that's something, something called dependence and tolerance. And it also means that if we've been on opioids for a long period of time, if we stop them immediately, we can start to have some withdrawal. And we can start to have some craving of those medications. And physical dependence is that normal physiology that would happen with all of us. Again, when Jana was talking about weak in spirit and talking about mood issues, we sometimes label people that have become dependent on a medication as weak. Well, they, they did this to themselves. And doctors have to own that, unfortunately, we did this to a few generations of people thinking we were doing the right thing by prescribing opioids for a long period of time, and we're changing that. But the problem occurs, too, when the opioid use continues after the pain is decreased. So we take them for an acute period of time, but then because of that feeling of joy and comfort, we continue to take them, and the pain is less than what it used to be. But that feeling of that comfort continues, and that's what can lead to that longer-term dependence. And in some cases, a compulsion occurs, meaning four to six hours of the medication, it's out of your body, and you get this feeling that I need that medication again and you start to search it out. That's called a compulsion. 
And the compulsion defies reason or logic for many of us. We say, why does that person keep looking for this medication? And they have this never-ending desire for an opioid. And it's something that we just can't comprehend. But it's very, very legitimate and very real. And this happens just in normal physiology in our brain. And the brain is changed. The brain experiences these changes that then affect that behavior. And the brain learns to crave these opioids. And then when the opioids aren't present, the receptors send pain and discomfort signals to the brain. So I'm never here to tell you that we don't have pain. Pain is very legitimate. But we're now knowing that pain actually originates in the brain. Pain isn't our nerve endings. That's where we experience short-term pain. We cut ourselves, we have pain. But pain and the way we regulate it is all up here. Now, that's not to mean that pain is in our head. That's not what I'm saying. But pain is regulated in these receptors that are in the brain. And we can change the way the brain views pain with other types of modalities. We can actually do that without the need for opioids. And tolerance grows over a long period of time. So what that means is as we take them over a longer period of time, we become less sensitive to them. And we need that higher dose to give us that lower effect that we once had. And then that starts to create this physical dependence. Meaning if we abruptly stopped it, our body will actually go through some physical changes. And it is possible to be physically dependent on a drug without being addicted to it. But both occur because of these true physical changes in the brain. And this is an important thing to um, distinguish. Dependence and then addiction. Anytime we're on an opioid medication for a longer period of time, our body, our brain will become dependent on it. That does not mean we're addicted to it. The term addiction means when you're searching out in non-normal ways to get that medication. An addiction is when it starts to interfere with your functioning, with your relationships with um, family, friends, etc. That's when you then start to have addictive behaviors that can occur. And again, substance addiction, it's that behavioral syndrome that's by a repeated compulsive seeking of the substance despite adverse, meaning negative, social, psychological, or physical consequences. You know it's bad to keep taking this, but you keep searching it out over and over and over, despite having negative consequences that occur. And that physical need for the increased amount of the substance as time goes on increases to achieve that same desired effect. So you need to have an addiction, you need to have both of these things going on. The behavior, but then also that physical need that's occurring, and that's what defines an addiction. Addiction versus dependence. So addiction is chronically relapsing, where physical dependence, that means that if the medication is withdrawn, you'll have a withdrawal syndrome because the drug is, at, is abruptly stopped. Now, if you're on a medication, while we're talking about withdrawal syndrome, um, you can stop opioids and you will not die. That's one of the take homes today. You may feel like you wanna die because of that withdrawal, which is very different than uh, benzodiazepines. If you've been taking benzodiazepines for a long period of time, you should not stop them abruptly because you do have an increased risk of dying. And they should be tapered down very slowly. So that's a take-home message for um, if you have family members that are looking at ways to de decrease the opioids that they might be taking. Um, you won't die from it being decreased. Um, again, you're, you'll go through withdrawal, but there are a lot of medications that can help you with the withdrawal feelings. And the withdrawal that we can, um, it's kind of the, the opposite of what the drug did. So if we know that the opioid receptors in our brain gave you that intense joy initially and feeling of comfort, what's the negative of that? The withdrawal feeling is often depression. We feel very, very sad and we're very despondent 
and uh, we can have shakes and tremors and sweats and stuff like that, and that's part of that withdrawal. But one of the number one things is that feeling of sadness, overwhelming sadness that comes um, over us. So then what do we want to do? We don't like feeling sad. We take that next opioid again that makes us feel better or makes us feel quote unquote normal again. And these are some of the myths about addiction. But for many years, we in society thought that people that were addicted to drugs or alcohol did that because they were weak in character or they had bad morals. And we made choices and judgments, but it doesn't account for all people. It's really important to recognize that. And many people are treated with prescription painkillers for legitimate pain. That's how we started. Only to discover years later that we exchanged a pain problem for a dependence or an addiction. Addiction behaviors. So once the addiction sets in, we have certain behaviors that quickly develop to sustain the need for more and more of that drug to get that same effect. But the rest of the world sees people that have these behaviors as cunning or devious or ugly or covert, dangerous and destructive. So we have to change society's views towards addiction behaviors. And the addicted person has a lot of mood swings that are unpredictable. They may exhibit manipulative behaviors. They may lie. They may uh, be unable to keep appointments in their uh, life. They may neglect important relationships and different responsibilities. And again, they continue to use the substance despite all of these negative consequences, which is again really baffling for anybody who has never had an addiction. We don't understand why. We say, why can't you just stop it? But these are the cycles of dependence and addiction that have been there for a, uh, for a long time. Again, there is help for these addictive behaviors. So that's another take home, is that there is true help that you, we can offer to family members, to friends of yours, to yourselves. And the cycle of addiction to opioids, it's a cycle of highs and lows. And that high, when we talked about that euphoria that we may sometimes initially get, and in the beginning, the lows are just a return to the normal. But we start to see that much like heroin and other opioids, they're all in the same class of, medic, uh, of, of chemicals. But it's a trap because we initially see that there is no downside. I mean, who would not want to feel euphoric? Who would not want to feel contentment? That's something we as human beings crave. We want to get to that certain state. But this is where the cycle of the addiction of the opioids really comes to, starts to set in. And then we see escalation occur. Because that level of euphoria, that level of contentment, isn't as great as it was those first few times. And then people start to feel less than normal without that opioid in their system. And now the opioid only causes feelings of normality, not euphoria anymore it level sets you back to that feeling of just being normal. And then the process has reversed itself because before people felt normal without the opioid, but now they only feel normal with it. And as time goes on, more and more opioids are needed to feel normal and to prevent the withdrawal. And depression starts to take over while taking the opioids. And then there's a lot of fear Meaning, if I stopped this right now, I may have overwhelming depression or feelings of despair and despondency, plus then the physical effects of the withdrawal as well. Why, again? This addiction with opioids is unintentional. Meaning, we as doctors didn't write out this prescription in the first place thinking, I'm going to make you addicted. It was meant to really try to reduce people's pain and suffering and we went actually through a couple of decades being told by the pharmaceutical industry that we had to deal with people's pain more appropriately and um, the emotional attraction with the opioids can give that false sense of safety and many young people think they're safe because they're not using heroin or they're not using a needle in their arm and we often have heard this too. They're prescriptions. They're legitimate prescriptions. And many people in society think they're safe because they're a prescription. They come from the doctor. My doctor prescribed them. So of course they must be safe. 
and they're supposed to be used for acute episodes. We never should have gotten into a habit of using them for long term, but we were told differing things from the medical establishment, from the pharmaceutical establishment, and now we're trying to change that. Another thing, well, if they're FDA approved, they must be safe. Everything that is approved by the FDA has benefits and risks. Every single medication, every herbal thing that you might take has a benefit, and there's a risk to it as well. Aspirin, we take it very commonly to reduce the risk of stroke and heart disease in people that have high risk factors. But yet, it came from a bark of a tree. It's natural. Aspirin is natural, it comes from nature. But yet, you take too much, and you could have a bleeding ulcer. You take too much, it could affect other things going on in your brain and equilibrium and, and um, you know, hearing difficulties with too much. So again, it's just to show that even though we may prescribe things for very legitimate needs, there's always a balance between benefits and risks of the medication. And now we're finding with long-term use of opioids not used for cancer pain. Again, not used for cancer pain. We're talking about the chronic conditions, low back pain. People that have garden variety of low back pain have been taking opioids for years. There's probably more risk now with that versus true benefit. Street drugs, we talked about this already, but buying Oxycontin, Vicodin, Percocet on the street can be really expensive. And then if we're really dependent on that, we start to possibly switch to heroin, which is about five to 10 times cheaper on the street. And we've seen this actually happen in the state of Oregon where the heroin use started to increase as well and it's paralleling the amount of opioid use that's occurring. So we have challenges. We have to help change patient expectations. When we are patients and we have pain, we do want to give help as to reducing that pain. But we have a challenge with what we perceive and what opioids can do and what they can't do. We also have challenges from the pharmaceutical industry. If you watch the nightly news, I was a little aghast at a one hour segment of the nightly news. Pick a channel from 6 to 7 p.m. and then count how many commercials you see from the pharmaceutical industry. I was amazed and we're one of the only countries that doesn't regulate this or ask the good reasons as to why. Now, I feel having education is really, really good. So if we could educate people through commercials as to different medications that are available, that would be great. But the number one reason those, what we call direct con to consumer commercials are on the TV, the number one reason is to have people come into the doctor's office to say, I want that brand new medication. That's the number one reason. They want to sell more of these medications. And that's one of the things that we're going to have to come to grips with in the United States. There was also a lot of legislation and standards that got us to this place. Meaning if you were in the hospital right now, there was a law that said your nurse or your doctor is supposed to ask you about your pain rating. On a scale of 1 to 10, where is your pain right now? And again, asking people about pain and having good conversations about it is very important. But it was a law that made us kind of swing the pendulum the other way. We did it because of a rule and maybe not because of the true intent of what we should have been doing. And if you're in the hospital side, right now Medicare will pay hospitals for high patient satisfaction scores. So if you're managing a hospital or in an emergency room and you're supposed to try to get as much money as you can from Medicare to care for the population, you're going to try your best to make your experience very, very good. And those ER doctors and nurses might potentially give us as consumers of healthcare everything that we want or desire, just in an effort to keep us happy. There is an issue with opioid prescribing from the emergency room, so we're having those discussions with the emergency room doctors to say, if you really feel it's not in the best interest, of that person sitting in front of you right now, don't just give it because you're worried about having a negative patient satisfaction score come your way. You still got to do what's right 
for the person in front of you and talk about the risks and the benefits. So what do we all need to do collectively? We need to understand the four classes of pain. And the one that's in red is the chronic non-cancer pain. That's the big thing that we're talking about right now. We're not talking about acute pain, a fracture, something we need short term. We're not talking about not using opioids for cancer related pain or end of life pain. This is not the discussion, but it's really what are other modalities of treatment? What are other ways we can get on top of pain for pain that's considered chronic, that's again, not cancer. And I could talk about headaches, back pain, conditions of fibromyalgia, which are real. But we now know that actually the American Association of Rheumatologists said the worst thing we can do for patients that have fibromyalgia is start them on narcotic medications or opioid medications. So we need better tools in our tool belt to talk to people now about other ways that we can reduce pain. And we need to change expectations from all of us. So this little happy scale again of the diagram of how much do you hurt, we ask this in our clinics, we ask this in the hospitals. And most people, if you ask them, how much do you think we could reduce your pain by using an opioid prescription? Most people would say, well, I, probably 75%. And that's a good amount of pain relief, right? 75%. But in theory, we need to look at alternatives because the actual pain relief that we get with opioids for chronic non-cancer pain is about 30%. So the community expects 75% pain relief, but all that opioids will give you is about 30% pain relief. And no study at all has demonstrated any long-term improvement over time. And no study has yet demonstrated long-term safety. I remember when I was in practice in Purdue Pharmaceuticals, seeing I was on the pharmaceutical bandwagon rant, um, but Purdue, as a pharmaceutical industry, they came around and they started telling doctors about OxyContin. And they told me and all of my colleagues that OxyContin was not addictive. And we found out years later that they hid all of that information from the public. And they were fined. And um, uh, high-ranking officials in their pharmaceutical company were fined and, and um, went to jail. But we talk about this because it set up a problem with how they talked to physicians. And we believe them. So we need now better training that is dependent not from the pharmaceutical industry, but coming from other studies, from patients, from physicians and we need less reliance on the studies that are coming from the pharmaceutical industry itself. So, if you go see a primary care doctor now about pain, what are some different things that we might talk to you about? Now, physical fitness, 30 to 60% reduction in pain. And you may have experienced this yourself. If you have acute pain, meaning you've broke something, if you're going and moving that broken arm, you're gonna have more pain, so we wouldn't want you to do that. But all the studies have shown that lifelong activity, keeping yourselves active, an active body equals an active mind. And an active body is actually shown to reduce pain feeling in the brain. 30 to 60% reduction. There's something called cognitive behavioral therapy. It's retraining the brain. Remember I said that brain starts in the, or pain starts in the brain? It's ways we can actually retrain the brain to look at, at, at pain. Sleep restoration. Sleep is very, very important if you have pain. And they took a bunch of people that didn't have pain before they started, and then they put them through a study where for a week to two weeks, they kept waking them up every couple of hours and didn't get them to have what we call this REM sleep, rapid eye movement, it's, uh, that's what it, call, it stands for. That's, that's when the brain goes into a restorative point. And they were never able to get their REM sleep. And what happened after two weeks out all these people started developing pain in their body where before they never had it to begin with. So we know that proper sleep is really, really important with trying to get on top of uh, pain. But again, the opioids, they only do about 30% reduction. There's other medications called tricyclic antidepressants, amitriptyline, Elevil, are some of the names you may have heard. 
they might reduce uh, pain in certain conditions by about 30 percent. Seizure medications, there might be about a 30 percent reduction with certain seizure medications that we now use for nerve pain. And then acupuncture, about 10 percent effectiveness. And it depends on which type of acupuncture and which part of the body. So a lot of good studies now, if you've heard of tennis elbow, golfer's elbow, if you have acupuncture right at that site, that your pain uh, from that condition is significantly decreased. So we need to have more community involvement about the opioid discussion. And really it's talking to doctors and other health professionals, learning about current best practices regarding the treatment for non-cancer uh, pain. We need to talk to our patients one-on-one, -on -one, those that are on the opioids, as to the benefits and the risks and other ways we might be able to manage their pain. And we really need to talk, ha have the discussion with our public, our community, so that they understand the changes in the science, the changes in the medical mm -hmm. establishment regarding the prescribing of opioids. And so that our community can support their family and friends that might be going through this difficulty right now. We also need to learn more about naloxone. And naloxone is something that can actually save a person's life if they stop breathing because of the opioids. It quickly gets that breathing back in place again because of how it affects the brain. So there's an antidote for this. And in the state of Oregon now, there's a law that's been passed that pharmacists can dispense naloxone to a family member or a friend to have available so that people that are on high-dose opioids, we could actually save their life. The EMTs, the paramedics, the police, sheriffs, they're all being trained to have naloxone available as well. So that as first responders, if they come across somebody who may not be breathing anymore because of an opioid, they can try that to try to get the effects of the respiratory depression of the brain back on track so that they can start to breathe. And it actually has been, uh, it's on the CDC website, instructional videos on how to use this appropriately. Do you have a comment or question? Is this a free thing they can get So uh, health plans, there still is a charge or a, The pharmacist can dispense the product to you, but they're still dependent on your insurance plan for co-pays and stuff like that. So it's not free. Now, if you as a EMT or a police person had this available, they're gonna give this because it's the right thing to do. They're not gonna turn around and then charge you for that. But if you had family members that needed that prescription, that would be dependent on your own prescription coverage and health plan coverage. So all in all, I like this one because we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. We're not here talking about people that have pain and are making it up. Pain is real. We have to have a lot of compassion with people that have pain. And we have to have compassion with people that have been using long-term opioids for a long period of time because we thought at a period of time that it was the right thing to do. So again, opioids do have that role to play in the treatment of acute and post-surgical pain in cancer and other deteriorating painful conditions, and in some chronic conditions when utilized at safe doses. And so just be prepared if you or family members have been on these medications for a while, that your regular doctor may be wanting to have that discussion with you now about risks and benefits. And it really, really is because of a public health issue. People that are dying unintentionally so with that, I think we might have a few moments for some questions before we have um, Crystal talk to us about interactions and f of food and medicine. So any comments, questions? Yep. So the question was, does Oregon keep track of doctors prescribing opiates? Yes, there is a state program called the Oregon Prescription Drug Monitoring Program. And pharmacies and physicians nurse practitioners, PAs, can all sign up uh, so that they, the amount of narcotic medication, opioid medications that are prescribed can be tracked. And you can actually, can. It's not mandatory. 
It is something that um, there has, there's been a lot of discussion in the state. This program has been in existence probably about four or five years. Um, they wanted to make it easy to get people to use it in the first place so they did not make it mandatory. There have been some discussions of possibly heading in that direction, but we're not there yet. But then I can, I work in urgent care, I can go in and see for any given patient the amount of prescriptions of opioids that have been prescribed for that patient and who else may have been prescribing them, whether it's a dentist, a specialist, a primary care doctor. But it's not mandatory that you use it. But we're trying to talk about this as a best practice with our physicians. To answer your question, the information is collected. I'm usually a loud talker, so <laughs> I'm not sure I need it. But to answer your question, so the information is collected and it's there um, and that is done you don't have to sign up so to speak to have that information collected the state collects basically it's all of the opiates that are filled at pharmacies um, and the the patient and the provider and the drug what is not mandatory is whether or not a provider signs up for it and that's that's the unfortunate part is we have all this information available but very few people as far as on pharmacists or provider side actually utilize the program to look at it but the information is there all right hands is there anything we can do about television advertising <laughs> you could talk to your yeah congressmen senators so the question was prednisone, how does that fit in? Well, prednisone is a steroid, so it's not in the opioid class. Prednisone is sometimes used to decrease the amount of inflammation that might be present in the body, often used in rheumatoid conditions and trying to get to as low a dose as possible. But that's one of the areas they might use prednisone. Question? So naloxone has been available in our area for the last couple of months. We started talking about this uh, situation that we have in Oregon and in our three county area through a task force that was developed last April of 2015. And we invited all the emergency personnel to be part of this discussion. And they started to utilize this within the last couple of months and have this available. Question? Right, so going with other modalities that can reduce that amount of pain. And I think there definitely is a role with chiropractics. Um, within Samaritan, we have residents that go through training with osteopathic manipulation. And some of that has been very, very effective for low back pain. Without any of those red flags that might be occurring, low back pain with fever, with infection, due to a disc that's truly herniated out and not just bulging. But the, yes, there's a lot of different modalities that people can try without first going to an op opioid prescription for a painful condition. So we do want to make sure Crystal has uh, time to go through her discussion. So thank you so much for your attention and your kind comments and <laughs> questions. And we'll move on next to Crystal. Thank you.